after the class. So if you don't have one or you want, <laughs> that's true, an, an autographed manuscript. But, uh, all right, great. Thanks for uh, coming in earlier than usual, but uh, why don't we start with prayer? The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, who pours out on all who desire it the spirit of grace and of supplication, deliver us when we draw nigh to thee from coldness of heart and wanderings of mind, that with steadfast thoughts and kindled affections, we may worship thee in spirit and in truth through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Welcome back, session four on Richard Hooker and the laws of ecclesiastical polity. As you can see from the heading on your handout, we're going to be discussing preaching in book five of the laws of ecclesiastical polity. But first, since not all of you have been here for every session, a brief review at the top of your handout are three summary paragraphs from our previous times together. In our first session, uh, Father Jones emphasized those aspects of Hooker that said basically the church and the commonwealth, the government, can make laws and ordinances in the church as may best serve to abolish superstition and establish the worship of God in a perfect form. The church and the culture have a great deal of uh, flexibility in this regard to determine the right order of worship within the community. Now, this ability, this flexibility, is not unlimited. As you can see in the second session, we talked about the fact that Hooker makes clear that the doctrines of the church are not open to tinkering, manipulation, and democratic processes. The doctrines of the gospel are not open to vote or modification by the church. But there is um, a great discretion, as I said, accorded the church. And he identifies this discretion as in what some people call the Anglican stool or hooker's stool. Um, the church can turn to scripture for those things that are required in worship. We mentioned the words of institution during communion, the idea of the Sabbath, the use of the Lord's Prayer and the Psalms. Um, tradition, that is um, what the church has decided. We noted that Hooker said just because it's always been done that way doesn't mean that things need to be discarded. The form of the Holy Communion, the use of certain feasts and observances and the like. That's all okay, according to Hooker, as long as it's not repugnant to Scripture. And finally, Hooker encouraged the use of reason, not private judgment, not an individual determination as to what the church should do or shouldn't do in worship on an individual or congregational basis, but the reasoned collective consensus of the church, especially over time, is a means of determining what right worship and abolishing superstition would mean. And then finally, last week, Father Jones talked about, Eric, if you need a handout, we have one more up here, um, about where uh, to worship. There was conflict about uh, whether churches were truly necessary. Could you have home church in lieu of church? And Hooker's very clear, we exhort everyone to worship God everywhere, but we hold that no place is so good for the performance of worship by God's assembled people as the church. And that no exhortation is so appropriate as David's when he said, oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. First uh, extra credit question, where else do we see in Anglican worship the invocation of the Worshiping in the beauty of holiness. Anyone recognize that? Who says the daily office? Eric, where do you see that text? Only for morning. It's at the end of Psalm 95 as it's retooled for the introductory uh, psalm for morning prayer, the Benighty. Uh, oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. 
for he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth, etc. So, um, worshiping the Lord in the beauty of holiness is embedded in our daily round of Anglican worship. So that, by way of review, sessions one, two, and three in a nutshell. So where are we now? You may remember back to week one, uh, Father Jones talked about the uh, rap battle between uh, Richard Hooker as the uh, priest in the temple, uh, one of the original parachurch organizations there in London set up for the attorneys and judges of the community, and his nemesis, Walter Travers, a Puritan preacher. Hooker would preach in the morning, Travers in the afternoon, uh, opposing viewpoints frequently about the beauty of holiness and what that consisted of. Travers is banished to Ireland. Hooker put on sabbatical, as it were, in order to write the laws of ecclesiastical polity and describe a defense of the established church. But as these things go in bureaucracies, that wasn't the end of the battle. You see, Travers had a mentor. His name was Thomas Cartwright. Cartwright's a bishop. He's a conforming bishop in the church, and he uses his uh, bully pulpit, as it were, to engage in a pamphlet battle with the established church about just what is the beauty of holiness. And in a nutshell, Cartwright, in a particular document that gives rise to these chapters of the laws of ecclesiastical polity, has two major criticisms um, of the established church. And these are going to sound strange to you because I've sort of distilled them to their essence in the interest of getting through this in a timely fashion today. One, you don't do enough preaching, Church of England. There is not enough preaching in your services. And two, there's too much scripture. Not enough preaching, too much scripture in your worship. Now, I'm going to explain what each of those mean, but hang on to the weirdness of that for a moment because that's intentional. I, 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 I want you to want to understand what he's saying. In the spirit of Hooker, I want to put Cartwright's criticisms in the best light possible. So I'll start each of the coming sections with an articulation of the Puritan view about what we're doing wrong in the established Church of England at the end of the 16th century. Hooker, uh, well, in a nutshell, uh, the first criticism is, you don't do enough preaching. The Puritans looked at the round of services in the Church of England at the time. They looked at morning and evening prayer. Many places, the canonical hours of 10 and 4. There's a clerk. Hence the, the, the evolution of the term cleric. There's a clerk, a sub-clergy person, and a minister, and maybe a few people. And they read morning or evening prayer, depending on what time it is. There's seldom a sermon in these services. Day in and day out, it's mostly prayer and scripture in accordance with the right set forth in, at this point, the 1559 Book of Common Prayer, which is very similar to the one we use now. So no sermons. And on Sundays, the Puritans point out, many of your clergy don't preach. They read from a book of homilies. It's not their words. It's not their interpretation. It's just more blah, blah, blah from the pulpit. More reading. Where's the sermon? Where's the spirit? at work in your ministers, says Cartwright. More preaching, he says. Being the good logician that he is, Hooker responds by defining his terms. And he defines preaching in a fairly expansive way. And I've included <clears throat> both his wind-up and uh, part of his conclusion here on the second half of the first page of your handout. And to save my voice and to ensure at least one of you is awake, can I have a volunteer to read that paragraph to AI aloud for us, if you don't mind? Uh, Josh. <clears throat> 
Josiah, could you hand him the microphone? Uh, a, a, a I or a it is the knowledge of God. Yeah. It is the knowledge of God that it, is it, on? Yeah. it is the knowledge of God that is the sure ground of all our happiness and the seed of whatever perfect virtue might grow in us. This sort of knowledge is the primary and most important thing that God imparts to his people. Our duty to receive this wisdom from his merciful hands is the first of those religious offices with which we publicly honor him here on earth. To instruct all sorts of people on how to inherit eternal life, it is necessary that we openly teach the sacred and saving truths of God. We call this open publication of heavenly mysteries by the name preaching. Thank you. Point for Gryffindor on uh, the extra credit assignment. Thank you. Well done. The publication of heavenly mysteries is preaching. The publication of the knowledge of God is preaching. That's a pretty expansive definition of preaching. All the dissemination of knowledge of God is preaching. Now, Hooker does set some limits on what he means by preaching. He goes on to say, catechizing, catechesis, catechism, is something different. He says that catechism may be carried out in the schools or in private homes. And it's to be distinguished from preaching, which is always done in public and within the open hearing of the people. Preaching is not the same as teaching in that the objective is not only to teach the truth, but to proclaim the faith. In a nutshell, what Hooker can be heard to be saying, can be read to be saying in this, is that preaching is by definition the publication of knowledge about God in a public setting. It is involved with proclamation of the faith. Whereas catechism, catechesis, can be done in private and doesn't necessarily involve a proclamation. I appreciate his distinction, but there's a lot of similarity between the two. In fact, the only real difference seems to be, if I'm reading Hooker correctly, that one is by definition done in public and one can be done in schools and in private areas or maybe even more public settings than that. So there's, I would say that catechesis is a subset of preaching, a lesser included form of preaching within the universe of Anglican discipleship. And Hooker identifies three key vehicles by which ministers of the church transmit this information. By reference to the Decalogue, which he cites as being received from God through Moses, the Lord's Prayer through Jesus from God, and then the Apostles' Creed from the writings of the Apostles, by divine inspiration. So, does that answer Cartwright's question? If you turn to page two of your handout, we see the beginnings of Hooker's answer to Cartwright's criticism. In sum, Hooker says that scripture reading is part of preaching, is part of preaching. Scripture reading is part of preaching. In the interest of sharing the pedagogical excitement, is there another volunteer that can read uh, paragraph B-I, beginning with the Church Today broadcast the same truth? Can anyone do that for me? Richard? Richard Gaber, the distinguished uh, Frenchman. She has received it and witnessed it through the sacred volumes of Scripture. She does so first by testifying to that truth and secondly by explaining the mysteries discovered hidden in, hidden in Scripture. When the church acts as a witness, she preaches God's revealed truth through readings of sacred Scripture. In this sense, reading of Holy Writ is a form of preaching. Thank you, Richard. Why do Anglicans have so much scripture? 
in the course of daily morning and evening prayer and Holy Communion. You know, as, as a nutshell, you're always going to see at least two readings in the mainstream Anglican rites. Morning and evening prayer have an Old Testament and a New Testament reading along with a whole passel of psalms. And the Holy Communion service has at least an epistle and a gospel reading, although can be supplemented typically by an Old Testament reading in psalms in a variety of permutations. Cartwright may quibble with this definition, but Hooker has sort of claimed the field. He says, if we're reading scripture, we're preaching, so you can't say we're not preaching. More about this in a minute. But Cartwright has some other sort of pinpoint attacks on the definition. He said, OK, even accepting the notion that reading scripture is in and of itself preaching, you're reading from the wrong Bible. You're reading from an unreliable Bible. You're reading from a Bible with mistranslations that's not in, in sync with the latest in scholarship coming out of Geneva. I have over here, says Cartwright, a Bible promulgated from Geneva and brought to us by St. John Knox of the Scottish Church, the Geneva Bible. You should use this. If you have to read scripture, use the right Bible because this is the best of Protestant scholarship. Hooker responds, the great Bible that we're using is close enough because for every one of those difficulties you point out, I can point out other difficulties in the Geneva Bible. And the church gets to decide which Bible it uses. You're substituting the judgment of some for the judgment of the ecclesia, the church. He says, use common sense. He said, the Holy Spirit is present when we listen to scripture. It moves in the hearts of believers by action of their baptism and their faith. And Hooker asks Cartwright and the Puritans to trust scripture to speak in a plain sense and not to get involved in academic disputes at the level of daily worship. And the second point that Cartwright brings up is, all right, so you're reading lots of scripture. Good, I can accept that. But it shouldn't be during worship because the primary purpose of worship is to, to sermonize, to speak the whole, God speaking by action of the Holy Spirit through the minister. And if you're going to read scripture, you should read it outside of worship, like they do in Geneva. In Swiss worship, and those of you who aren't catching the references, John Calvin, the Protestant reformer, has set up in Geneva by this time, and his followers are um, entrepreneurs trying to share Calvinist theology or the second generation thereof throughout Europe. And many English and Scottish and Irish expatriates have gone to Geneva and Zurich and elsewhere, Strasbourg, to learn at the hands or the feet of these Protestant reformers. And now they're back in England trying to say, hey, let's do it like they do in Geneva. But uh, Hooker responds, as we would anticipate, based on the first three sessions we've had, he says, look, the church gets to decide how it worships to abolish superstition and to edify God. And you can't be saying that we can't incorporate scripture into that process of worship. He points out that the Genevans sing metrical psalms from scripture during their worship but the fact that they rely upon the preacher to announce scripture and uh, refer to scripture as necessary during their sermon, it's just not the way that the church in England has decided to do it. Geneva can do it one way, England can do it another. This is something you're gonna hear in uh, Hooker time and time again. He is remarkably irenic and ecumenical in terms of what the Protestant Reformation means abroad. It does not mean monolithic, medieval Catholic style uniformity. But there is an additional and more powerful, I would suggest, response to Cartwright 
in what comes next, in the next chapter. Modern Anglicans are accused of being weak on Scripture, having a low sense of Scripture. Some of you are old enough to remember an, a bishop of the Episcopal Church to say, the church wrote Scripture, we can change it. Infamous words, I don't, <laughs> I don't offer that. It's like 1984, it's not a how-to manual, no. This, the, don't do like that bishop said back in the uh, beginning of the 21st century. Hooker says to the Puritans, don't be afraid of Scripture. <laughs> scripture is God's word written. And this is a wonderfully powerful description of the Anglican vision of Scripture. And I need a third volunteer to do this for us. If you could read uh, paragraph C there, be underneath, sermons are not the only way to preach God's word. Anybody? Uh, there we go. Thank you, Kevin. Sermons are not the only way to preach God's word. We all confess that scripture is God's word. Every proposition in it, every sentence, is to us a heavenly principle. This is especially so of that truth that leads to our salvation, since it is the most certain and most sure, surely infallible part of Scripture. Like all things of value, this one has its cost. We do not bring the knowledge of God with us into the world. Therefore, whatever suitable means exist for broadcasting the mysteries of God's word, whether publicly in church, which we shall call preaching, or in private, the word by every means, even the most commonplace, does save. This happens not only by means of sermons. Thank you. The word, by every means, even the most commonplace, even the poorest, most barely literate cleric reading the, the scripture in some rural parish, can and does save. Take that, Puritans. And Anglicanism's robust view of scripture is not only captured here in Hooker's um, academic treatise on what it means to be the Church of England, but also in the Articles of Religion, and in the fact that we value Scripture and its power so much, and we invite the presence of the Holy Spirit so actively, so formally, that um, we consider Scripture to be a form of preaching, and indeed a saving means of preaching in the services of the Church, even if there is not a formal, recognizable sermon by the minister. Kent, if you go wait for the microphone. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, did, her, <clears throat> did Hooker ever counter uh, Cartwright's argument about worship, what the purpose of worship was? Because when we see worship in heaven, I don't recall sermons. Um, Worship in the Old Testament, when angels are part of it, no sermons. I mean, for him to, to, for Cartwright to say that the primary purpose of worship is, you know, sermons sort of lacks scriptural basis, ironically. It, thank you, Kent. The question being, um, did Hooker mount a direct um, response to Cartwright about the primacy of sermons. These five chapters are the thrust of it, but Father Jones next week is going to be talking about common prayer, common worship. He continues the argument in those chapters as well about what worship is and what it's for. This is the beginning of his argument more than the end of it. So stand by for some more. And... Uh, but keep an eye out also all during book five because it, it occurs at various points. Your point is a good one. Um, and I think we know the, the best biblical response. In, in heaven we will know, we will see, <laughs> not through a glass darkly. You know, and There will be um, a different perspective that may obviate the need for sermonizing in heaven. And uh, likewise, 
it might be good to get started in that way now. But I see another question. Bill. Yeah, the, I, my question is, without scripture, it leads to a, a, rec, a father or a priest deviating from scripture. And does he, does Hooker address the, you know, opening in that door of without, you know, just doing preaching and no word, that's going to lead to um, false doctrine and, and heresy. He does, and that's uh, a great segue to the next two chapters that we're going to talk about now, where he talks about, so you want preaching. Let's talk about preaching. And Hooker goes on uh, to talk about that in just a bit. I, I do want to talk about one more thing that Hooker includes here, because, um, and we will get to that, Bill, but just give me three minutes here to talk about subparagraph D. Preaching and teaching with special reference to the Apocrypha. Now, for those of you who are new to Anglicanism or still uh, orbiting around uh, the Anglican uh, experience, <clears throat> one of the ways in which um, Anglicanism might differ from other parts of Protestant or evangelical Christianity is our recognition that certain books that are recognized by Scripture in the Catholic and Orthodox Church have some value for teaching in our community. These are the so-called apocryphal books, books that were in the Greek Old Testament but were not adopted for use by the Jewish people uh, in their canon of worship decided shortly after Christ. But I'll describe briefly for you. Um, in Article 6 of the Articles of Religion, that, which is in effect at the time Hooker is writing, the church reads these other books for examples of life and instruction of manners, but does not apply them to establish any doctrine. And it lists those books there. But for those of you who may be praying along in the daily office, Right now, for example, the church is reading from the Book of Wisdom, also called Ecclesiasticus, and we'll also be reading from a book called Sirach soon, and uh, there are others. These are um, books that were also incorporated in the original translation of the King James Version of the Bible. They are in the uh, original translation and published in 1611 of the scripts of uh, the Bible. Uh, and Hooker notes that we don't read all of them in church. We read Judith, Tobit, Baruch, Wisdom, and uh, Ecclesiasticus. They are read publicly in church, uh, and the rest we leave for people to read on their own in private. Hooker acknowledges to Cartwright that they are not like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. At the bottom of page two, you'll see he says, is it not generally acknowledged that these books are holy, they're ecclesiastical and sacred, but to call them divine books is not to honor them above their merits and that the whole Church of Christ from the beginning until now has approved their suitability for instructing people on life and morality. That's a little bit of an exaggeration because there was no defined canon of scripture really until the 16th century. There was great dispute among the various parts of the church throughout the world as to what the canon of scripture is. You know, there's great consensus about the core, but it was the edges that people disputed about. And uh, the Catholic Church, for example, issued its first description of the canons of Scripture in what they claimed was an ecumenical council in Trent in the 16th century. And uh, the confessions of faith issued by the Protestant denominations all staked out views, usually excluding these uh, 
apocryphal or deuterocanonical books, but Anglicanism embraced them with the caveat that they had a lesser purpose. No doctrine, ethics, morals, behavior, okay. It cannot be reasonably thought, says Hooker, that we do any disgrace to the Word of God or lift up human writings above Scripture if on certain solemn occasions we choose to read lessons from these books instead of chapters from Scripture. By making such a choice, we are only selecting what is most suitable, not that which is most holy. Hooker is careful not to claim too much for these readings. And that is a good point. And um, the, the Puritans would have none of it in the canon, and the Church of England had decided to the contrary. The law of the land, the act of uniformity and supremacy in effect at the time, said that they were part of Scripture. And as Hooker said in sessions 1, 2, and 3, the church gets to decide things like that. Just because an academic or an individual or even a group of believers believe to the contrary, in terms of setting out worship, not doctrine, but worship, we can incorporate these other readings into these worship services for the purpose of edifying the hearers and glorifying God. The, um, if we turn to uh, page three, we get to Bill Fleming's question about um, is preaching everything it's cracked up to be? I say this as somebody who was brought into the Anglican way by good preaching. Our divines, especially the 16th and 17th century divines, the Carolyn divines, Yep. We don't publish a lot of systematic theology. We don't publish a lot of meditations on uh, issues about the Trinity and uh, the divine procession and uh, concepts of uh, systematic theology, which the Genevan and Lutheran scholars are spending a huge amount of time on. What people frequently publish are sermons. Anglicanism is a sermon-based church, so... This criticism that we don't do sermons ultimately is overcome by events and is primarily of value today because it helps us understand why we value Scripture so much and, and the place of Scripture in our worship services. But Hooker helps us to, be, uh, to not put preaching on a, a pedestal not to make preaching an idol. Because, as Hooker points out, the purpose of Scripture is not just to provide material for sermons. It's not just to, to be a rhetorical proof text source for Scripture, for sermonizers. Hooker points out that sermons can go wrong that sermons can be presumptuous and distort God's truth. This is particularly true if there is no scripture shared with the worshipers during the service. Those of you who think, oh, well, we've learned our lesson in this regard. If you've ever worshipped in a, a, perhaps a parachurch setting, um, even within Anglicanism, you see this sometimes. Uh, you know, what, what's the sort of standard um, Hillsong type of uh, worship service? You know, three, three praise songs and a really long sermon, and then some extemporaneous prayers, and then everyone goes, with maybe after another praise song. Um, Puritanism lives on in a lot of ways in modern Protestantism and evangelicalism, and the idolization or centralization of the sermon is subject to these same uh, criticisms that Hooker makes. It's, it's really, Scripture has got to be 
a leavening agent, a guide, a guardrail against the presumptuous sermonizer, the sermonizer who goes beyond Scripture, who imposes requirements for salvation that are not in the text. And by having a Scripture-heavy service, Hooker says, that's how Anglicanism guards the deposit of faith. Our preachers are constrained by Scripture. They are not artists. They are speaking with the assistance of the Holy Spirit, but always held up against the standards for salvation announced in Scripture. He also points out that um, we emphasize within the Church of England and the Anglican tradition therefrom sacraments in a way that the Puritans might not fully embrace and might even reject or repudiate. And um, I don't want to put too sharp a point on this because at the time in the Church of England, there was not weekly communion. It's probably quarterly communion, in some places less frequent than that. Baptisms were sometimes private. They weren't done in church, or at least weren't done on Sundays. They were done on a Saturday or some other circumstance when the priest was available. So it's not necessarily the regular celebration of communion that Hooker's talking about when he talks about the sacraments and preaching. He's talking about the nature that sacraments give to the church, what it means to be a sacramental church. And this quote is, um, if I were on Twitter, I would put three little flames next to this quote, you know, to say this is a really hot uh, bit of prose. <coughs> but it is sort of long, so I would ask um, someone to volunteer to read um, paragraph E3 on the last page. After the intro, sermon, sacraments can be efficacious without sermons. Anybody? Ah, good. Thank you. Sacraments can be efficacious without sermons. We hold it to be safer and a great deal better to give them encouragement and to remind them that it is not the depth of their knowledge, but the intensity of their faith, which is acceptable to God. We should also assure them that those who hunger and thirst after righteousness will be satisfied, that no lack of means can prejudice the truth of God's promise, that the weaker of the resources of the church, the greater is the need to sharpen our own efforts, and that struggling painfully with the use of feeble resources yields more than being lazy and negligent in the midst of many resources. Thank you. He would definitely be ratioed in, uh, in Puritan circles these days on Twitter for that. But um, the key point is, it is not the depth of knowledge, but the intensity of their faith which is acceptable to God. We should assure them, when he says them, it's the, both the people and the Puritans, that those who hunger and thirst after righteousness will be satisfied, and that no lack of means can prejudice the truth of God's promise. He, Hooker, is arguing that um, a bare-bones communion service, for example, The believers who participate in that will experience the presence of Christ when they receive his body and blood by faith in the bread and the wine. Likewise, a baptism is going to work as long as it's God wills it to work, and it's done in accordance with the rite of the church. You don't need a sermon to be grafted onto the church. You don't need a sermon for the elements of communion to give you the grace that is promised by Christ to everyone who takes the communion with faith. I would add that there is a great deal of Scripture in both those services anyway. The prayer book is Scripture <laughs> paraphrased in so many ways. 
And if you listen when your uh, Father Jones is leading the prayers during the canon leading up to Holy Communion, there's scripture woven through all that. The words of the institution are taken virtually right out of scripture. So there is a sermon in the rite that's associated with both baptism and Holy Communion. Hooker brings some heat as well to parishioners and perhaps to Puritan and nonconformist congregations throughout England at the time. He says, he goes on, he says, you know why sermons are so pre prevalent? And that all other means seem to be asleep and do nothing? Is that people everywhere have a singular attractions for sermons and a cold disdain for readings. This seems to give away the farm, right? I mean, Hooker's yielding to Cartwright, isn't he? No. <laughs> this is jujitsu. This is uh, rhetorical judo. He says, part of the reason for this is that sermons have become a show. This is the artistry that our adversaries employ to elevate sermons in the estimation of people above all other means of instructions. Sermons have become the point, not the means to an end. Another reason, he says, is the careless habit of people to let almost any reading that they've heard from the lectern, many times before, just pass by their ears, especially if you know you're going to hear it again next year at the same time. So there's showmanship in the pulpit, not quite attentive listeners for the readings from the lectern. And then he closes with the observation that sermons have the special advantage of securing attention because they're novel. They're new each week. You hear something creative and colorful from your sermonizer. And because the listener supposes that if you miss a sermon, that you're going to miss something. Oh, no, I didn't hear the, the word preached. He says this is the real cause for disagreement. This need for novelty, this tickling of the ears among the listeners. Hooker has a pretty powerful criticism of some language that the Puritans have come to use, and it continues within Protestant and evangelicalism today. What comes from the pulpit can include the word of God, but is not by definition the word of God. Father Jones, however blessed and godly a priest, does not simply by virtue of opening his mouth, or heaven forbid, a deacon occupying the pulpit, does not by definition transmit the word of God. And yet, Hooker notes that the Puritans have taken to referring to their sermons as the word of God. He says, the word of God is, is the word. <laughs> and if you insist on extending it further, it is scripture. But it is not the words of every wandering preacher who takes a pulpit somewhere in rural England. That can be the word of God, but it is not a guarantee. And he asks the Puritans to objectively assess things in light of human fallibility in light of the realities that they see before them about the quality of the sermons throughout the realm. The Church of England did undertake several measures to improve the quality of preaching and teaching in the Church of England in this latter half of the 16th century. I mentioned the two books of homilies, which are provided for um, priests and other clerics, including the numerous permanent deacons that were used at that time, that could read from the pulpit uh, without fear of falling short of doctrinal correctness and the proclamation of the knowledge of God. 
Also, education was emphasized among clergy. It was no longer just what the youngest son in the noble family did. Their bishops were encouraged to recruit uh, for the clergy people with academic and scholastic potential, not just people who could not find work otherwise. And over time, the Church of England did cultivate a preaching culture in a sense that perhaps Cartwright wouldn't embrace, but he did at least acknowledge. But that being noted, I think Hooker's argument in response to Cartwright's criticisms is a powerful one. If you hear an Old Testament reading, an epistle, and a gospel, and listen, and don't just say, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that from last year. And don't just look for the artistry in the pulpit, but focus on Scripture. Have your Bible open when the sermon is being preached. Read the Scripture passages in advance before you come to communion on Sundays. And talk about it afterwards with your family. That is a great means of discipleship to have sort of the equivalent of evening prayer in the home and sharing insights and responses to the sermon that day and, and reading it against scripture to make sure that uh, your ears weren't tickled inappropriately by the words of the preacher. We don't need to trade our inheritance of good Anglican preaching for a bowl of porridge that casts aside the importance of uh, checking it against scripture and building a scripture-based worship service as opposed to one that might tend toward, as he says, presumptuous and distorting of God's truth. We've come full circle and we're on time. I, I do want to um, loop back, though, to um, the first page and just leave two quotes with you. The primary and most important thing that the church does is to impart the knowledge of God to the listeners, to the body of Christ in its care. The primary and most important thing that God imparts to his people is the knowledge of God and our duty, he calls it, to receive this wisdom is the first of those religious offices with which we publicly honor him here on earth. This is a true saying and, and worthy of belief. And um, the rich tradition of using scripture in our worship services is um, a testament to the fact that the Church of England and its Anglican successors um, is, is grounded in godly worship and not in the improvisations of man. But Hooker has um, one final short quote that I will leave with you as we close and open for questions. Regardless of how you do it and how long you preach and how much scripture there is in a service, Hooker says, that which will save believers is knowledge of the cross of Christ. And that is the only proper subject of all preaching. Hard to improve on that. And I would only say amen. So that's Hooker on preaching, but really about scripture in worship. And we're at noon. We've got about uh, 10 minutes before we uh, circle around for food and hospitality and uh, fellowship. Anybody have any questions, observations, or concerns about Richard Hooker on preaching? Anybody? Everybody wants to get to the soup and food. Uh, Kent. It seems to me that um, in this little back and forth between Cartwright and, and Hooker, that it would be sort of apparent that sermons are commentary on scripture and therefore can only approach the fullness of truth insofar as they focus on scripture. 
But sermons, the, the purpose of sermons, discipling, is to integrate Scripture, basically to instruct us how to integrate Scripture into our lives, our beliefs, etc. And so it, it seems to me that to say that there's too much, I mean, too much Scripture is perhaps it's a, a anachronistic view of, of Cartwright to say that how could he miss it? But um, it, it just doesn't seem like it would be a, a a serious question. Kent questions um, anyone who would, and, and this probably could come from either camp, the, the folks who neglect the value of scripture for producing life-changing conduct, you know, application of scripture, and those who would facilitate it through sermons. You know, um, you don't want to to leave the wisdom of Scripture in your inchoate, unformed, you know, okay, I read that, but I don't know what it means. Valid point. I don't think Hooker would argue with that either. What Hooker is arguing about is, as he often does, is balance. You know, we do sermons. <laughs> we let Scripture speak for itself in many of our parishes. You do sermons, but frequently you distort scripture or you lose sight of scripture. But I think both would agree that sometimes we need help in applying it. Right. Yeah, clear scriptural warrant for, come on down, you, you can come down. But what I would suggest is an unintended consequence, oh, hey, I won't say that, a consequence of the Protestant Reformation, just as the consequence of the medieval Catholicism and its clericalism and the like, is to infantilize believers. Just think about that for a bit. I was talking with uh, a longtime Anglican uh, who's uh, taking a study course right now from one of our Reformed Episcopal seminaries, one of our august teachers, and uh, she's reading a commentary uh, by a noted evangelical scholar about the Book of Romans. And um, she has a Zoom conference with the teacher every week, and they talk about the passage and the commentary, and she noted that the commentator had spent six pages talking about six verses whose meaning was readily understandable and diagramming the various academic disputes between schools of thought about what they really meant and what this meant and everything. And the commentator, after several pages, came out exactly where this reader this learned Anglican, who shall remain nameless, came out after her initial read. So my fear is that by saying, oh, no, 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 we need to hear from the pulpit in order to apply scripture, or you need to read the lectionaries, read through the Bible in a year like the traditional lectionary did uh, in order to really be a good Bible scholar. Um, I think both of those things are not entirely accurate views. I think that a baptized believer <laughs> prayerfully considering scripture can learn an awful lot without the aid of academics or deacons or heaven forbid even presbyters telling him or her what to believe. And I think by cultivating 45-minute sermons and study series on Romans 8 through 11, you know, um, we, we intimidate people away from Scripture. Say, well, I'm not smart like him, or I can't dig through Scripture like that like she can. I, I think a, a lot is done in the day in and day out of regular Bible reading by believers without anybody from the church helping. So... And I don't want to go all Baptist on us here and take my collar off and uh, convert. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that prayerfully 
consider Scripture and don't be afraid to do that. So, that which will save believers is knowledge of the cross of Christ. And that is the only proper subject of all preaching. That's within all our realms. Even the youngest child can understand that Christ died for me. So. Father Jones, would you mind closing us with prayer? Notice 1210. Right. Uh, you've fulfilled the contract here. Let us pray. Thank you. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness and your grace toward us. Thank you for the cross of Jesus. Please bless us now as we come to lunch and bless this food and bless our time together through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And everybody, and uh, next week, uh, common prayer with Father Jones. I'll be watching, though, from Greensboro, North Carolina, so make me proud. <laughs> <laughs>